Okay, so welcome along everybody to your uh, weekly SETI seminar series. Today we're very lucky to be joined by Uma Gorty, who's a uh, PI at the SETI Institute. Uh, Uma got her uh, bachelor's uh, at the University of Bombay and then did a master's of science and PhD at the Indian Institute of Astrophysics. Uh, she then came across to the United States to do her postdocs at uh, NASA Ames and at uh, UC Berkeley. Uh, and uh, her research has revolved around uh, dust around stars. Uh, her, she has published on such topics as line emission from gas and from dust disks around young stars, uh, the thermal balance, chemistry and infrared spectra of uh, intermediate age disks, uh, and uh, also gas drag dy dynamics around uh, protostellar nuclei uh, in gas clumps. Uh, so today she's going to talk to us about uh, the subject of her most recent research into uh, the dispersal of uh, protoplanetary disks. So if you'll join me in welcoming Uma. Um, thank you, um, Adrian. And it's actually a pleasure to be speaking here. I've joined here about three years ago, and I believe this is my first talk at the Institute, really. <laughs> So um, what I'll talk today about is the dispersal of protoplanetary disks. And this is work I've been doing largely with David Hollenbach, also at SETI. And uh, Ilaria Pescucci has been an old collaborator from the University of Tucson. She and, she and I started working on disks together, in fact. And Case Dulavond and Gennaro D'Angelo are a couple of people who are involved in some of the research I present in this talk. And there are many others whom I will not mention, but uh, who have contributed in some way or the other to what I'm going to say. And so I have roughly about uh, three different uh, topics I will cover. The very first will be um, star formation. And the reason for going through this is just to sort of put the whole things and everything in context, because I'll be talking about disks. And you will see that it's very related to the star formation process itself. And then I'll go on to describe a little bit about disk evolution. I will concentrate on what we know from observations. And I will not really cover all of disk evolution. This is an enormous topic in itself. There are various little details that different people work on. I will only touch on those aspects that are related to disk dispersal. So I will give a sort of sketchy introduction of, um, and discussion of disk evolution. And the main part of my talk will actually involve disk dispersal. And I will describe in detail the process of photoevaporation, which we believe is what drives this dispersal. And that will be uh, the result of most of our recent theoretical models. And uh, so to begin, we have this is a sort of a schematic sketch of how we think star formation proceeds. It's, um, it was a picture that was set forth way back in the uh, late 1980s or so. And how we believe it proceeds is that there is a um, there is a molecular cloud core. There these, it's the interstellar medium. It's usually, it's very cold. It's you do these clouds that are in the galaxy. And parts of them clump together and, for, and then undergo gravitational collapse by, because of some trigger. And uh, so that leads to the formation of a star. And this is a runaway process. And the densities increase enormously. And you get a star in the center. And now it so happens that this core is actually initially rotating. And because this core rotates, when it collapses along the equatorial plane, you have angular momentum balancing gravity out. And so what, what results is a flattened structure. And that's the beginning of the disk. I mean, that's really how the disks form, which is basically going to be the topic of the entire talk. And it's driven largely by, and it's, it's due to the rotation of the core that initially come, uh, is rotating before it collapses. And, this, and the disk turns out to be quite important in the entire star formation process, because most of the material from the envelope lands onto the central forming object through the disk. So the material actually is processed through the disk before it ends up on the star. And the disk also drives these enormous outflows, which are very, very powerful. And they, do a very, they play a very important role in that they get rid of most of the angular momentum. You really need to get, lose angular momentum by almost six orders of magnitude before you actually form the star. Otherwise, the central object would just spin too fast and break up, and you wouldn't be able to form a star. So the disk also plays an important role in driving these outflows. And eventually, what happens is that the material in the envelope is either accreted onto the star, forms the star, 
or it's possible that uh, it gets um, dispersed by the outflow, some of it does get dispersed by the outflow, and the envelope disappears, and then what you end up with is a disk that's still there, it's a remnant disk, and um, so the accretion stops because there really isn't much to accrete anymore, and at some point planets begin to form. Although I've put it here, we really don't know exactly in what stage planets begin to form, but by this stage it's believed that any forming planets are probably already in the disk. And eventually, this disk completely disappears, and then you have a planetary system sort of like our own. And um, so the disk is gone, and you have a planetary system. So this is what we believe happens in star formation. But it turns out that um, you know, you, many, much of this picture is actually uh, confirmed observationally. So I will sh go quickly through some slides to sort of show you that this is not all just a schematic. We actually see many of these stages. So this is an image of a cloud, this dark object in the middle is the uh, it's a um, globule, and it's dark because it's blocking out the light from the background stars around it. And the same image, when you look at it in with Spitzer, which is an infrared telescope, you can you can actually see part of the emission from this thing. And then you can you can see those central protostars. So this bright object in the middle is an embedded protostar. And so that's sort of the picture that uh, you know you're sort of looking at something close to that stage or shortly after that. And you can also um, you also see jets, and this is a very a famous jet, but it's a Hubble image. It's around the star DG Tau, and what you're looking at here, this bright green image, is the jet. And this dark, obscure thing, which you don't really see, that's the disk. And the reason, it, and the reason you, you really don't see the central star here, it's being blocked out by the disk completely. And these, um, these, the light out here is escaping from the central star, illuminating the cavity in the sides of the disk. So you're really looking at something like that, if you can sort of make the connections. And uh, you also see, uh, this is a very interesting uh, recent observation. So this is a debris disk around the star HR 8799. So this is about a 1,000 AU disk, this yellow thing here. That's the size of Pluto's orbit there. And what you can see is that um, this disk was recently imaged and uh, to, to find three planets within about 15 AU of the star. So you actually see this is one of the few disks where planets have been directly imaged around the star. So you do see that as well. And uh, of course, we do know that planetary systems are common around stars. We have a lot of Kepler data that shows us that. And it, this is a schematic of one of these, uh, the Kepler-11 system, which shows a planetary system around the star. And um, so the, the, the disks ev evidently play an enormous role in both star and planet formation. And so in star formation, of course, the disk allows the mass buildup of the star. Stuff is flowing through the disk to land on the star. And it decretes envelope material uh, via the disk. And what this shows is um, this is the wavelength versus energy in the um, ultraviolet region of the star BB Tau. It's a young star. And you can see that all the matter that's falling onto the star, we actually see things falling onto the star, the actual buildup process. And it's, it's visible via this emission by a shock. So this material is flowing onto the star. It gets shocked and emits in the um, near UV and the far UV. And uh, so what you see is a shock. Hmm, what you see is a, is a shock emission from it. And you can, so the dark lines are, uh, are the observations and that fit through it is basically a model that shows you that uh, it's, um, it's emission from the shock. And not only that, yeah, sure. There are places that have no uh, spikes. Those are lines. Just Those are lines. Yeah, Those are emission between, lines. Yeah, so there is a gap. Yeah, so there is, uh, so this is, I think it's a fuse image, or no, it's a <laughs> IUE image, and I think there's a gap in the spectra like that. Okay. Yes. So, um, and you actually have, uh, the disk also loses angular momentum. This is one of the things that we uh, uh, spoke about earlier. It was necessary. And this is actually a wonderful image of, this, uh, of, a, glob of a disk around in this globule. And what this shows is the CO outflow. And if you can sort of imagine uh, the green in the picture being the star's rest velocity, so the blue is stuff moving towards you, and the red is material moving away from you. So what this shows is a clear rotation of the jet. So what this demonstrates is that, and it turns out that the jet rotation direction is the same as the disk rotation, which is measured independently by the observations. And you can see that this clearly shows that angular momentum is being carried away by the uh, jet, which is what you essentially want. So the disk drives the outflows. So we know that uh, it allows the star to lose angular momentum and slow down its spin. And you really, like I mentioned earlier, you need to really get rid of the angular momentum of almost six orders of magnitude before you get to the star. 
And um, of course, it also plays a role in planet formation. This is obvious because a planet actually forms in the disk. And so you would need to, uh, so, you know, so obviously things like the disk mass, the solids that spread that are present in the disk, as well as the gas, and would influence the kind of planets you would form because it obviously depends on what the available raw material is. And this is basically a picture of all the different orbits from uh, the Kepler orrery by Dan Fabriki. And this is just basically to show you that a whole diverse range of systems is possible and, you know, and some of it at least is reflecting the diversity in the original disk properties that these objects were made out of. And uh, of course, if you, if you know the disk, we saw before that the disks do disappear, and obviously if they disappear too early, then you, can't, you probably don't have enough time to form planets. And if the disk survives too long, then maybe they'd exert torques on any planets that are already in there and then move it. So obviously it has effects on uh, the planet formation in the disk. And if there are very small amounts of gas left at very late stages after all the planets have formed, it, might, it still plays an important role because you might uh, have drag, and this is a, uh, the results of, a sim of a work by Kominami and Ida, and what they really show is that if you had gas drag, and this is about an Earth mass or so um, in the terrestrial zone, and so if you didn't have any gas, then you can see the ob orbit state of these, these four things are planets that are in there. The yellow objects are the uh, terrestrial planets of the solar system and their current eccentricities. And you can see that without drag, the orbits can remain quite eccentric, which is not what we see. But if you have enough, uh, even a small amount of gas, and you can drag these orbits down, and you could sort of circularize the orbits. So it could be important even, so even these trace amounts of gas, if they're left long enough, could be important for planetary dynamics. So the main question that um, we will try to address is how do these disks evolve and how exactly do they disperse? Because we need to know, to answer any of these questions to understand star formation or planet formation, we need to have some idea of how these disks actually evolve and how they disperse. And so I will move on to my um, next uh, part of the talk, which is mainly about disk evolution. And what we know is the disk, as you saw, was initially formed out of the molecular cloud material. And so the raw material is essentially a, a lot of gas. It's mostly in mass molecular hydrogen, almost 99% of it. But suspended in them are these really small particles of solid, or solids, which we call <laughs> dust. They're submicron in size. And even though they're a very small component by mass, they are uh, very useful because that's how we usually probe disks. They absorb stellar light very easily, and they radiate it back in the infrared, and you can see them very easily. So most of what we know about dust, disk, or about disk evolution in general, is gleaned from dust studies. And uh, the dust evolves in the disk. All sorts of things happen, which you can infer from looking at the emission. And moreover, so this is sort of the you know, it's roughly the same four stages I showed you before, but what I'm showing you here now is the wavelength and the flux uh, emitted at every wavelength, or what's called the spectral energy distribution. And you can see when the disk, when the object is cold, it's mostly, emission is mostly in the submillimeter. This is when you're still sort of forming the star. And later on, the central object starts getting hotter and hotter, and then uh, the infrared excess, the dark gray region out here, is really the emission from the dust. And as the disk evolves and the central object gets even hotter, uh, you know, you can see that there is still an excess emission, eventually it disappears. It's sort of the same uh, thing, but you know, you need to know, um, so this gray region out here is basically the emission from the disk, and you can um, infer a whole lot of things by low studying things like these, like the SEDs, or looking at the energy distribution of uh, what the dust is emitting. Yeah. Could you give us the time scale yield roughly? Uh, yeah, so this is about, uh, this, stage is believed to be about half a million years or so, the embedded stage. This is probably about a million years or even less. It's sort of uncertain because uh, in the initial stages, they're sort of embedded, they're harder to observe, and it's much more difficult to even age them accurately, but it's believed that it's about of that order. Uh, these disks, I will talk about how long the disks last, but this class two is like usually when the object is about a few billion years old, and class three are, could possibly be debris disks. I mean, these are disks which have already formed planets, and they could be anywhere to tens of millions of years old. So that's roughly the, um, and I will talk about that some more. So, uh, so the most important thing that uh, you get from these observations is, or at least from my point of view, is uh, the disk dust, li the disk lifetime. And this plot here is um, a plot of the 
age of a cluster, so they, you basically take star clusters, which are young uh, stars, which most of them are form, actually formed in clusters, and you can age them better because you can compare them with stellar models and you can get accurate ages. So what's plotted in the x-axis is the age of a cluster. So each of these points represents one cluster. And then what's plotted in the y-axis is the number of stars in that particular cluster, the fraction of stars that show an infrared excess. So what this plot is really doing is looking at a bunch of uh, stars in a cluster and then trying to figure out which one of them has a disk and which one of them doesn't and then count the number that has a disk. So all it's looking for is the presence or absence of a disk. It doesn't tell you, really tell you much about how much there is or what it's doing. So what you see here is infrared excess fraction and you can see that this is uh, in log units. So the six is really a million years and the seven is 10 million years. And what you can see is that when the disks are really young, at about a million years, almost all of them, 100% of them, possess disks. So I'm looking, so now just pay attention to the black points. I'll get to the others later. So if you see the black points, those are the near-infrared excesses in the JHK bands. And uh, so you can see that almost all of them show this. And then this shows a decline. And the, um, um, the time over which disk lands can be roughly identified as about five million years, and by which time most of the dust in the disk has disappeared. So this was the original plot compiled by Lynn Hillenbrand. And so, but uh, bear in mind that what you're really probing here is the near infrared excess, which means you're looking at hot dust because you're looking at shorter wavelengths. <coughs> so this is stuff really close to the star within about an AU or so. Uh, but you can repeat the similar uh, the same exercise for at longer wavelengths to see what happens to, disk, to dust further out. And I've sort of plotted on top of that plot, I've put in uh, Spitzer points, which look at 5 micron and 24 micron um, emission and similar studies. And you can see that those points, which actually probed this further out, maybe about 10 AU or so, and you can see that they uh, lie pretty much along that same, um, along the earlier data. And um, so there's also plots that I had not shown here because it's harder to explain and it's not really easy to directly put them on the same plot, but there's also a correlation between sub-millimeter emission by dust. Now you're looking at dust, really coal dust, like you know, sort of 50 to hundreds of AU outside. And that uh, emission is also correlated with the near-infrared or the infrared emission. So what that means is that if you see an infrared excess, it means if you see dust in the inner part of the disk, then you see a sub-millimeter emission, which is emission of the outer part of the disk. And if you don't see the inside, you also don't see the outside. So there's a correlation which sort of suggests that the outer disk also disappears on roughly similar timescales. So based on all these observations, we can set a lifetime, uh, a dust disk lifetime, of the order of about 5 million years or so. And um, if you remember, I said that the gas was the dominant component. Well, I'll get to that later. But it turns out that if you do uh, a similar, and there was a study by Fidel et al which looked at the mass accretion rate fraction. So now what you're looking at is not the emission from the disk, but you're looking at how many of the objects in this cluster are accreting versus how many are not accreting. Because you know that the disk accretes, and if it's there, you know, it's accreting onto the star, and at some point it's stopping. So what that tells you then is it's a measure of um, whether there's gas in the inner disk at all. So you're looking at sort of, it's a, it's a measure of gas in the inner disk. And you can see that those points, if I plotted those on top of the same plot, and you can see that uh, that also sort of follows the same trend, which suggests initially at least that the uh, gas might do the same thing as the dust is doing. But um, the unfortunate part is that the gas itself is very, very difficult to measure. And there have only been two such studies that I know of. One was way back in 1995, and this was a study that I was involved in. It was a Spitzer study. And what we did was we looked at the Spitzer mid in the mid-infrared bands for emission from gas. And so we sort of surveyed some 20 odd objects, and these were really deep uh, measurements, which had stared at each object for a long time, and it, uh, to see if there's any gas at all. And it turns out that for this range of about five to 30 million years that our sample covered, we saw nothing. So all these points are really uh, upper limits. So all we can, what we have plotted here is the age of the system versus the uh, surface density you might expect. And the way we get this really is that from our models, we sort of know that if you had you know, more than the certain amount of gas, then it would have shown up as line emission, which would have been detectable by Spitzer, but we didn't see anything. So they can sort of set a limit on how much gas there really is in these systems. And also, this really probes gas within about 40 AU. We're not sensitive to gas outside of that, because it's, it falls in the far infrared, which is beyond the Spitzer bands. So, from this study, it's one of the only ones that exist, but um, what you can say is that the gas disk lifetime is 
is of course poorly constrained, but it's of the, it's of the order of between 5 to 30 million years. And so the uh, thing to take away from all this, from the point of view of planet formation, is that um, the planets must obviously form before the disk disperses. So it sort of sets a constraint on the time available to form planets in the disk. And so this, and of course, I think I've established by now that the disk actually does disperse. So we need to worry about what exactly disperses the disk. Why does it go away? And that's going to be the main part of my talk. So I'll talk about um, disk dispersal mechanisms. So the first and earliest um, mechanism proposed to disperse disk was viscous evolution. And now this is basically the process by which the star actually accretes mass from the disk. And so we know that it does operate on some scale, and we do see accretion signatures like I showed you before. And so what this shows is uh, the results from a model. And it shows the surface density distribution as a function of radius. And um, so this is what we started out with at t equal to 0. So we have this 0.1 solar mass disk around a solar mass star. And then we evolve that. So we have a viscous evolution um, you know, model. And it viscously evolves. But it turns out that what happens is that while stuff is being accreted onto the star and the disk goes down in mass, there's some mass that also carries the angular momentum outward, and so it must disperse. So what, the, so what a purely viscous, um, viscously evolving disk will do is it will go down in surface density. As you can see, these are all successive snapshots. Don't worry about what the exact times are, but just, you know, I just want you to take down that the surface density is slowly going down with time. And at um, some point, you know, and the disk is also spreading. You can see the radius is actually going further. This actually would go even more. It's just that I've cut off the surface density distribution at this point. So um, even at, so you can see that even at 10 million years, there is still a substantial amount of mass left in the disk. And there's like fairly high surface densities um, in the inner part of the disk, even at these late stages. So viscous evolution itself is um, not viable in the sense that it has, it, you, the time scales involved are way too long, and the disks don't really appear to evolve like that. Okay. Yeah. What's the major physical source of the viscosity of these models? Uh, well, so what we did was we just used an alpha prescription. So it's like you just bury everything in this unknown parameter alpha because the kinematic viscosity is not really known. So yes, yeah, so it's, 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 uh, it's a parameter you can vary. And if you did assume high values of alpha, you would probably get a faster evolution. But then uh, you have to justify why it's so high. And you don't really, it, also the accretion rates onto the star you drive would usually be very high if you did that. It's not, it's not being heated, it's just spreading out. So what's happening is like a diffusion, right? So you have, if you, take, if you imagine a, a ring of gas around a certain object, and it's kind of slowly spreading out. And what it's it does. Spreading out, it it, no, so it's losing energy. So what's happening is the dissipation process. So, it, so, so, so there's molecular viscosity at some, or kinematic viscosity at some level, right? So the source of this kinematic viscosity is, is still a big problem. People are not very sure what it is. People think it might be because of big, you know, magnetic fields in the disk that cause instabilities, for instance, but it's not, it's, it's debated. But there is something that causes, you know, that, that causes, um, the disk to dissipate. And then what the, when that happens, there's, you know, you can imagine of two parcels of gas, one of them that goes in, which loses energy, the other one which gains energy from the interaction and moves out. So it's like a spreading process, essentially. And some of it eventually gets onto the star and it's lost, and the part that goes out just keeps spreading. So it's something like that. And um, so the other, uh, another mechanism that was proposed is st uh, are stellar winds. So because the young stars have very strong winds, so they can be uh, very, very fast of the order of hundreds of kilometers per second. So then what they could do is sort of just shear away the top layer of the disk. So you have a disk, and then you have this stellar wind once the star forms, and it could just entrain material in, that, in the wind and then just take it away. But when you actually, so this was proposed for a long time and thought to be a viable <laughs> mechanism, but when detailed calculations were done, it was found that you, to, really sh uh, to really disperse the disk, you had to have a wind that was as strong as the accretion coming in, which is sort of imp uh, improbable because the accretion is what drives the wind, so you can't have 100% efficiency where you just have this thing coming in and all going out at the same time. So it turns out that it doesn't quite work. So it's not really, it's not as important as um, one might think. Another mechanism is close stellar encounters. You know, the stars are, in most cases, form in clusters. And so if you take, um, and you know, if you have a star in a cluster with a disk around it and you have this other star come by, you can have a close encounter, you can have it tidally strip the material off the disk and, you know, the disk that way. 
And it turns out, given typical sizes of disks and typical number densities of stars and the sizes of clusters and the typical interstar separation in a cluster, it's, it's only possible in the densest regions, and it's not possible as a general mechanism. And then, of course, you'd also have to explain the, num the number of disks that you see in isolated star-forming regions, which are also, um, which also dissipate. So it, can, again, can't be a very general mechanism. It's valid in certain, so certain circumstances. So, um, of course, there's planet formation. So one might argue that, well, you're forming planets, and that's what's happening to all the matter in the disk, is just forming planets, and that's where it goes. But then it turns out that you know, in our solar system, at least, we, if you count the mass in solids versus the mass in dust, um, sorry, the mass in solids versus the mass in gas, there's a lot less a gas than there would have been initially for in, in the interstellar medium. So there is, and this is what gives rise to the concept of what's called the minimum mass of the nebula. So the minimum mass that the disk would have, need to ha would have needed to have in order to form our present solar system. So which then clearly indicates that some of the da most of the gas in our solar system disk was dissipated. So you need a mechanism to disperse the gas anyway. And which will bring us to the main part of uh, what I will discuss in great detail, so is theory of photoevaporation. So this is what we believe is a drives disk dispersal. And what this is really is that you have the disk surface, which is, it just flared because gravity is weaker as you go further out, and it's, you know, the vertical structure is determined by thermal balance. And then, you, you, so it's because of the flared nature of the disk, the central star is able to eliminate the surface, and, when you, and the high energy photons that hit the surface heat the gas to very high temperatures. And then you can get to a, a situation where the thermal speed of the gas can exceed the escape velocity from the star, so you sort of set up a wind which will flow away. And uh, so this is called photoevaporation. And what's relevant for this is the so-called gravitational radius. It's a good number to keep in mind because, of course, it depends on what temperature you're heating the gas to. So for, if you heat the gas to 10,000 Kelvin in around a solar mass star, so the gravitational radius, which is basically what this is, is you know, if you take C squared on that side, you're just equating the thermal energy to the gravitational energy. And it's of the order of about 7 AU. But disks also rotate. They have angular momentum. So if you factor that in, it turns out a crit you get a critical radius of about 0.1 to 0.2 RJ, which is about an AU for a solar mass star. And if you, um, so this theory was first applied to disks, which were bathed by high energy or EUV photons or ionizing photons from nearby massive stars. And the fields are very intense. And uh, by Hollenbach et al. in 1994, and this was uh, confirmed by observations subsequently. So this is these are pictures by Hubble of uh, of disks in the Orion Nebula, which has massive stars. It's a cluster, and then you can see that there was a rim of ionized gas, and the and you know and the um, star, the massive star, is somewhere in that direction. So you can see the you know photoevaporating disks was see, actually seen. And also, there's this is a nice recent study by Mann and Rita Mann and Williams. And what they have done is looked at the Orion cluster and the most massive star in it, which is like theta 1c. And they sort of uh, derived, tried to estimate for each disk the mass of the disk versus the distance from the star, from the ionizing star. And you can see that there's, an in, there's a trend. And you know, so as you go further away from it, the disks are more massive, which means that it's less able to erode away the disks. So it works uh, in this situation. But then, of course, um, all stars are not in clusters. There are a good number of them that are pretty far from a massive O star for it to erode the disk. So you need to have a mechanism that explains uh, disk dispersal in general. And it turns out that very young low mass stars are themselves capable of eroding their own disks. And this is because they have um, very high UV and X-ray luminosities. The chromosphere is very active, which means that they produce a lot of UV and um, X-rays. And moreover, they, uh, so the X-rays can be of the order of almost 100 times higher than the present day sun. So they're very X-ray luminous. And then the uh, FUV also comes from the chromosphere. But then if you remember, there was an accretion shock which was landing on the star, which also generates, uh, it radiates primarily in the FUV. So these are far ultraviolet photons. Uh, and, and so FUV can be almost 10,000 times higher than the present day sun. So you have this very energetic radiation fields from young stars. And, these, and this, as turns out, is capable of um, driving uh, these photoevaporative flows. And I have here just a model of the 
this is the height versus the radius. It's a slice to the disk, and it sort of shows the temperature structure. And you can see that the surfaces can be heated to very high temperatures. And so it's, it's, it's high enough for photo evaporation. So that's essentially the point of that particular plot. So to come back to our earlier listed mechanisms, so viscous evolution, we know that it does not, cannot be solely responsible for removing the disk, but then it has to act, even though it has a long time scale. So it has to play a role in the whole thing, because we know that the star does accrete. We've ruled out these two. And planet formation, well, it might consume a good fraction of the solids, because uh, it turns out that there is a, a large fraction of the solids left. But you might still need a gas dispersal mechanism. Photo evaporation is <coughs> Sorry, effective outside this critical radius, which is about 1 AU for a 10,000 degree gas in the, um, around a star. But it, again, depends on the temperature. But this can be effective in the outer part of the disk. And so that's essentially um, the, um, so what I will describe now is, a, is our models, which combine the effects of photoevaporation by EUVF, UV, and X-ray photons from the star and viscous evolution and describe how the disk evolves. But before I move on, I sort of present this qualitative picture because it's sort of easier to see than just looking at, you know, trying to understand everything from the, uh, from the results. So this is um, a figure that sort of shows how things proceed in this model. And what this tells you is that what's shown here is the flare disk. This is a central star. And initially, you have a disk. And the blue part is the gas. And then these, the, these solids that are the dust particles suspended in the, in the gas. And so there is an outflow that this disk drives. So what happens is as the disk accretes, its surface density declines with time. And as the surface, as the accretion rate uh, is proportional to the surface density, so which means that as the disk surface density is going down, the accretion rate goes down with time. And uh, the accretion also powers the outflow, which means that if the accretion is going down, then the outflow rate is going down which then means that the column and the outflow is going down. So at some point, the column becomes thin enough that all the photons from the star can penetrate the column that is, uh, that is coming out of the outflow column, and then irradiate the disk. And that for FEV photons, which are the most penetrative initially. That's not a word. And uh, so uh, when you, the column gets down to about 10 to the 22 centimeters or so in this, in this, uh, in this region right next to the star, which shields the disk, so the FUV photons escape and can, ir and can irradiate the disk. And they set up a flow in the um, outer part of the disk. And so as, the, and as, and as disk evolution proceeds, this outflow becomes weaker and weaker. And eventually, you can get X-rays to, penet to penetrate. And you can get um, EUV to penetrate the disk. And they all begin irradiating the disk. And the disk is going down with, in mass on surface density with time. So, um, and then, so accretion is, of course, continuing at this time. And there are solids in the disk, which will probably collide, stick, and they grow, or they fragment, depending on um, what the collision velocities are. The larger objects that form sort of decouple with the gas is only the smaller objects that are co collisionally coupled. You really need something of the order of a few hundred microns or so for typical gas densities to stay collisionally coupled to the gas. So any larger objects that form settle down to the midplane. And the disk, of course, continues to photoevaporate. And so as we go on, the accretion rate is continuing to decrease, of course. And eventually, it so happens that at some critical radius, the accretion rate in a local annulus becomes lower than the photoevaporation rate. Now, if you remember, the photoevaporation rate was just determined from surface heating. And nothing really much is happening to the surface. It's only the mass and the disk that's declining. So that sort of stays constant throughout the whole evolution. So it's the accretion rate that's going down. And then eventually, it becomes lower than the photoevaporation rate. And once you do that, so in a given radial annulus, you're taking out more material than you're supplying by viscous accretion. So you create a gap, and you sort of effectively decouple the inner and the outer disks. And once you've done that, the outer disk is no longer able to supply material to the inner disk. And you know, so you, are just, you drain the inner disk out, and you create this sort of uh, hole or a gap in the disk. I mean, first a gap, and then a hole. Which wavelength do you need to make the hole if you don't have the x-rays? Make a hole? No, you can make a hole. It depends on how strong the field is. So you'd make a hole later. So it depends. So if you, for example, if your photoevaporation rate is very low, right? So what this means is you're, you're, you're essentially waiting for the sigma, the surface density in the disk, to go down to a certain value. So if you have a high field, then you can achieve this early on in the disk. So the disk is initially quite massive, and you've managed to create a hole. But if, you, if your field is low, then you're waiting till things have declined to the point that you can make a hole. So if you just had FUV, 
Yeah. You could still make it home. You can, and, but it would be at a rate of point. Yeah, you could. Okay. So, um, and so then what, what, once, what happens, the important thing that happens once you've opened up the hole is that now your illumination from the star is no longer oblique. So you're not just you know, trying to penetrate the disk and then hit the surface of the disk. But now you can directly illuminate that inner rim. And so you've gained a lot of, um, in terms of radiation flux. And so the photo evaporation rate now from here, from this rim surface, it can be quite high. And so depending on what parameters you assume, this, the disk can now erode much more rapidly than it did before the opening of this gap. And um, so finally, you lose all the gas. And they may be the largest solids that are left. And some of them form planets, or they have a degree disk. And that's essentially how the uh, entire disk uh, disperses. So that was a qualitative picture. What we really do is that we sort of solve for the disk surface density equation of evolution. So this is basically just the viscous equation that describes the evolution, the time, and this is the viscous term. And we have, sorry, the diffusion term. And then we have, we assume a kinematic viscosity, and we use an alpha prescription, which just means that you don't know what the viscosity is due to. You can sort of lump it in this parameter alpha, which you uh, sort of vary if you want to see what the effects of that are. And to that, we add a sink term. So this is the you know, uh, a decrease in surface density because of the photo evaporation rate. And this is because of the, the entire high energy flux from the star. And this, at any given radius and an instant of time, is proportional to the density of the flow times the sound speed. So that's basically what your sigma dot is. So which now means that you need to know what the density and the sound speed are. So this turns out to be the tricky part. So you have to actually, at every time step, take that surface density distribution that you have and make a 2D or 1 plus 1D model out of it. So you sort of you know, evolve that. So you can you consider heating and cooling and thermal balance, because you try to balance the heating and cooling. Because it can, it, it heat, is heated, the gas is heated by a variety of processes. It cools by line emission, collision with dust, and so on. And then you also need to worry about chemistry, because most of the coolants are trace species. So you need to sort of solve for a chemical network along with all this. And once you do all that, you get, uh, you could have determined the uh, density and temperature in the photoevaporative flow region. And after you've done this, then you sort of uh, you put, put that in there, go to the next time step, and then you have a new sigma, and you come back and you do this again. And you sort of go through this whole process, um, you know, for, till the entire disk disappears. And uh, so we have. Um, a dust model, which also needs to go in, because dust is important for heating and cooling. It also determines how much the disk is flared. So the dust evolution is important in that respect, too. We have a simple dust evolution model, and we're sort of working on making it uh, better. But right now, it's pretty simple. And what we do is we also consider that dust grains below a certain critical size will not be coupled with the flow. So you have a critical size that stays behind. and grains smaller than that are carried away with the flow. So you're sort of retaining some solids in the disk body road, but you take away the gas. And so this is sort of a surface density evolution model um, result from one of the models, and again shows the surface density as a fun sorry, the surface density is a function of radius. And you start off with an initial disk, and you can see the disk declines. And at some point, so the, in this case, it's about 2.4 million years for this particular model, you can see that a gap opens in the disk. So the inner disk then drains. And then now you're eliminating this rim. And as you evolve, the disk becomes, uh, disk sort of erodes away. And at the same time, you're removing matter from the outer disk as well. And that is causes the disk to truncate, so sort of evolving in this torus-like fashion. And uh, so that's essentially the picture of uh, photo evaporation. And the thing that drives photo evaporation in these models is mainly the FUV, in our models at least. And so what it does is it gets rid of a lot of the mass in the outer part of the disk. And for typical surface density distributions in disk, the mass reservoir is in the outer part. So you're getting rid of a bulk of the disk mass by the FUV photons. And um, so you can sort of carry out this exercise for different stellar masses. And this is it's sort of interesting, because it sort of gives you an idea of how likely, for example, um, planets are around massive stars or lower mass stars. And it's, it's a question of interest. And so we sort of did this exercise to find out what the, um, how the disk, what's plotted here is the disk dispersal time versus the uh, mass of the central star. 
And it turns out that for masses less than about three solar masses, it's almost flat. And this is because two processes compete against each other. You have significantly high radiation fields, but then you have lower gravity. And then you also start, and this is the mass of the initial disk is sort of proportional to the mass of the star, so you have less material to disperse to begin with. So these two factors, the lower disk mass and the lower gravity, sort of counteract the fact that you have a, a lower radiation field. And I don't think that particular little wiggle is particularly significant, I would consider that nearly flat. And at about three solar masses, it turns, yes? Does the UV, or the far UV drop very much when the accretion drops, or is that? It, for those, no, it does, yeah. Okay, so for, so yeah, yeah. So what we have is we have a chromospheric component, which we take from whatever the strength of the X-rays are, mm -hmm. which we know. And then to that, we add, and we also calculate the accretion rate onto the star. So we use sort of a black body to sort of get how much the uh, instantaneous FUV field is based on the accretion rate of the disk as it evolves, and we add that to the chromospheric component. So, so it doesn't completely die down when it becomes, when the accretion stops, it's, it goes down to the chromospheric value. Right, because even it's still a young star, and even though low mass, it still has some activity. Right, it does, yes. And so, yeah, so that's, in, fa in fact, the dominant reason why we thought that when you get here, there might be a peak around three solar masses, because, you know, you don't have too much chromospheric activity, and we thought it might make a big difference. But then it turns out that when you get to about three solar masses, even though the X-rays are going down, the star itself puts out a good portion of its energy in the FUV, so, you know, you get, you drive rates pretty high. And once you get to stellar luminosities, you're talking about orders of magnitude more in terms of the field. And so once you get to high, um, higher star, uh, higher mass stars, your disk, um, you know, y even though you have a larger disk and you have higher gravity, you still get rid of the disk fairly fast. So we find that for high mass stars, uh, the radiation field dominates everything, and you don't really get, um, you, you don't really get long-lived disks. So, um, and another thing that influences all this is the viscosity parameter, which is alpha, which we've, you know, which we've already said is uncertain. We don't know what it is. And you can actually vary that, and estimates of this vary from, uh, from group to group because they sort of try to figure out based on um, simulations as to what alpha could be. And it ranges from 10 to the minus 4 to 1. But then disk observations sort of suggest a value close to 0.01. I mean, if you look at from the observational point of view. And so we, that's what we took. So we have about, in those models that I showed you, we have about an alpha of 0.01. And you have to remember that nearly half of the disk mass is actually accreted because you're waiting for the uh, outflow to become optically thin to your photons. So most of the mass in the disk is actually being accreted, even though, well, not most of it, almost half of it. And moreover, so what uh, the alpha could also be a function of radius. We assume it's constant throughout the disk because we don't know what it is. It could also be a function of time. It might be high initially and low later or vice versa. So we don't have all that in, so this is just a caveat. And so you can see that it does depend on what alpha is. So for, the, for our initial value of 0.01, we get about a few million years. But if we have you know, a really small, uh, high alpha of, what was that? Low alpha of 10 to the minus 3, then we get a much longer disk lifetime. And for a high alpha, we get much lower disk lifetime. And this is for two reasons. One is that a higher alpha means that viscous evolution is, in general, doing things much more rapidly. You're creating much faster. You're spreading much faster. And moreover, in our models, since our FUV field stems from the accretion, you also have a higher accretion field. So it's evaporating stuff as it spreads out. So you sort of really get rid of the disk really fast. And if your alpha is low, then it turns out that you know, your disk survives longer. So that was just one of the things that we don't know and that disk evolution could uh, very well depend uh, majorly upon. And there's also this question in the literature of about what's important, whether it's FUV, X-rays, or FUV photons. And the reason that this is basically the ionizing photons, these are the X-rays, and these are the far ultraviolet photons. And the reason for that is that the whole disk dispersal picture is slightly different in each case. So in the EUV picture, what happens is if, if what's driving the evolution is mainly the ionizing photons from the star, then the disk is evolving viscously for a very long time. So it sort of spreads out. You have these really long disks. So what you would have then is these tenuous, really, really extended disks as the disk evolves. And then at some point, the EUV kicks in and then sort of erodes the whole disk. But the problem with this is that the EUV flux is, is um, n not known at all. I mean, you, know, you don't know what the EUV flux is because the intervening material between stars and the Earth can absorb out most of the EUV. So you can't, it's really very hard to observe it. But the strength of this model is that it predicted blue-shifted neon-2 lines. And neon-2 is ionized neon. It's one of the lines that come from ionized gas. 
and, and this was actually observed. So, and it was blue shifted at just about the amount that models had predicted, which is about 10 kilometers per second, which is the thermal speed of an ionized gas. And so that was one of the uh, strengths of this, but it hasn't been ruled out. It just, it just means that uh, we just don't know what it is. And uh, x-rays, so if you have x-rays driving photo evaporation, then the x-ray flux can be quite um, high. And because x-rays penetrate deeper than EUV, which means the flows are much denser and you're still heating it, so you get higher mass loss rates, which means things happen much faster. So you have a higher mass loss rate in general. And it turns out that x-rays can also ionize neon. They can take out the innermost electron of the K-shell, and so you can ionize it with one kV electron. So you can sort of also get a significant fraction of neon too in x-ray heated gas, even though it's not fully ionized. And uh, the, the models are also consistent with what's observed for the neon too. And one question is, there's a, there was a 6300 angstrom optical line that was predicted, but it has not, and was predicted to be blue shifted because it's supposed to come from this hot gas, neutral gas now because it's x-ray heated. It wasn't observed in at least one disk that was looked at, but then there are others, and so this is still an open question. It's not very clear as to what this O1 emission is and whether it comes from photo evaporation or not. And of course, the other thing is that if you look at intermediate and high mass stars, you now need a different dispersal mechanism because they don't really have a high x-rays. And so it's one of the things that's, again, still an open. So we personally, I personally believe that it's probably FUE that drives photo evaporation. And uh, one of the advantages is that it's very strong because initially, at least, it can come from accretion. Accretion rates can be quite high. And uh, the, the evolution is quantitatively different. So instead of just viscously evolving the whole disk and then opening a gap and eroding the disk from inside out, what you do with FUV uh, for the evaporation is that you sort of drive mass loss from the disk very early on in the disk evolution. So you're sort of depleting the disk off its mass on the outer edge way before you've even opened the gap or done anything to the gas on the inside. So it's, it's a qualitative different picture that, um, and so it's, um, yeah, so what I have here is a plot that I think supports this picture. So this is, uh, you know, emission uh, from, from young disks and slightly more evolved disks, Andrews et al. And so these are models fit to the data, fit, fit to SEDs. And you can see that this is the surface density as a function of radius. And you can see that the continuous disks, so the more evolved disks, have larger radii in general than the disks which are um, more evolved, which seem to be truncated. And uh, though the authors themselves interpreted differently, I sort of think that it's suggestive of um, the fact that you do have FEV photo evaporation acting in these cases. And um, so what, is all, what does all of this mean? I mean, so you have all this. So what does these different scenarios mean for planet formation, for instance, is one of the things we're interested in. And uh, the first thing is that planets need to form before the disk disperses. And so if you have, so these are models that I've taken from uh, these two papers, which are essentially the same um, uh, model, uh, team. And if you can see here, there is this, so what this shows here is time and the mass of a planet that's formed by the core accretion theory. So it shows these different phases where you form a solid core and then you sort of wait, you start accreting gas. So there's an initial uh, phase when you form a core. And once you've formed a rocky core and you're sort of trying to accrete gas, it's sort of a slow process because you're trying to contract so you can accrete more gas. And, and there's this long period where you know, the gas is, the, the planet is trying to accrete the surrounding gas. And at some point, which is called the crossover mass, when the planet solid mass becomes equal to the gaseous mass, it sort of experiences this uh, runaway phase because the envelope becomes unstable. And so it can accrete much more. And then you have um, you know, a really massive planet forming. And this is the standard core accretion theory for forming giant planets. And you can see in this model, so this red curve here and these two models here are all essentially the same initial condition. But what they've varied here is the time in which the disk disperses. And you can see that the disk, if it disperses at 4 million years, which is what was assumed in this paper, you get a planet of the order of about 50 Earth masses. Whereas if you assume it's 3.5, you get about Earth masses, 8 Earth masses. And if it's 2.5, it's 4 Earth masses. So you can see that the time in which the disk is, disappears sort of limits the amount of gas available and sort of limits the mass of the planet. So to some extent, uh, it suggests that the mass of the planet depends on the lifetime of the disk. So it depends on what sort of planet you form. You could form a Jupiter, which is a gas giant, or you could form sort of these rocky, more rocky objects with a little bit of gas around them, sort of like what Kepler is finding. And also, we also need to know where is the gas in the final stages. So is it in the um, 
outer disk or is it in the inner disk? If the outer disk survives, all you've done is cleared out stuff in the inner disk, then you may exert torque on the planets because it might gravitationally torque things and move them. And if it's obviously, and if it survives longest in the planet forming zones and you're getting rid of the uh, stuff outside, then you have a longer time in which you can form your planets and you can perhaps form more massive planets. And um, what about the gas that's left after the planet formation epochs? They can cause things to migrate or they can you know, drag the uh, cause drag. And so the Kepler in data do indicate that there are many closed-in planets, and so there may be some sort of um, migration or motion of these objects after they form. So we're sort of working on these models uh, with, uh, which sort of try to put in, uh, put in the torques experienced by these rocky-type cores once they're embedded in a disk that's um, undergoing photoevaporation and viscously evolving. And we sort of have this tentative result for now that you would expect in such a scenario that planets could be found at all radii and you wouldn't, uh, within about uh, 10 AU or so. And um, so there is, seems to be a you know, reasonably close correspondence between the planet formation time scale and disk uh, dispersal times in that they both seem to be of the same order. Now, this is sort of uncomfortable, and it, it, it raises many questions. So it sort of, to me, it, it sort of provokes a question of whether in some way are these two related. And they could be if, you know, if your planet formation itself initiates disk dispersal in some case, and that could be one way in which you could time these to happen, sort of at the same time. So for example, the solids which coagulate may remove all the uh, dust, and which sort of reduces the opacity, and high energy photons can penetrate much deeper into the disk. Maybe it drives bigger flows. That's a possibility. You could, if you had massive planets, maybe they open gaps in the disk, and once you've opened the gap and you've you know, sort of removed the disk, maybe you can irradiate the rim much more, and maybe you cause an increase in photoevaporation once you cause, once you form a massive planet. Another possibility is that you, maybe you need photoevaporation to remove the gas, and then maybe after you've removed the gas and you've lowered the gas to solids ratio is when you can form planets. So that might, there's a possible ways in which you can sort of get these to work together if they really do work together. And so we're sort of working on related ideas. And so I have, you know, so one thing that we need to do is work on better dust models because we need to do a proper evolution of dust. If you have to account for how much is going into planets, we need to worry about uh, how much dust is left behind and how much is really carried away. And of course, we're also working on, uh, we're trying to see if massive planets do play a role uh, in dispersing the disk, and we have this model where we take the same viscous evolution photoevaporation model, but now we insert a planet in there to see if it can sort of accelerate the whole photoevaporation process. So far, we found that it makes a marginal difference, not too much. So this is a planet that was inserted at one million years and was allowed to grow from 10 Earth masses to one Jupiter mass, and you can see that it does cause a slight acceleration, but not enough to be significant. And so we're also looking, um, I've been working on this for a while and haven't made too much progress, but I'm trying to do these hydro models which combine the radiation and thermal chemistry to sort of study everything in more detail. And I'm also involved in observational studies, and this is looking at things from the other angle, trying to actually probe the gas, which turns out to be a very difficult problem in terms of trying to um, actually measure the gas dispersal time scales, which hasn't been done satisfactorily yet. And so that's a summary of um, everything I've said. So it's uh, disk evolution is essential for understanding planet and form, uh, star formation. And disks around young stars are fairly short-lived, and we believe photo evaporation and viscosity, and primarily by FEV photons, drive disk evolution. And we think that higher mass stars probably have disks that survive for two short times to form planets, and it's probably more likely around stars of three solar masses or less. And hopefully with future missions, which we can sort of probe disks better and you know, try to get some observational handle on how gas disks evolve and how evolution proceeds. Thank you very much for your attention. Pima, uh, can I ask the first question? Yeah. Um, so the accretion process forming the FUV photons, mm -hmm. what's the physical process there that goes on in the chromosphere that allows that to happen? No, it's actually a shock. So there's, there's matter that is coming in from the disk, and it's believed that at some point the magnetic uh, field of the star cuts through the disk, right? It sort of intersects the disk. And once it reaches close to that magnetospheric truncation radius, then matter is forced to flow along felines, so it goes along the felines, and then it hits the surface, and it's just a shock. 
So you sort of, you know, you, so those models that I showed you actually calculate the flow and the column density is expected in those things, and they shock. Uh, the shock is what produces the emission. It's just a 10,000 degree, um, you know, temperature that the shock has. And that's basically it. Yeah, I just wanted uh, one quick comment and one question about uh, what you have here. Mm -hmm. So the quick comment would be, you sort of alluded to it, that uh, there is, it is sort of uncomfortable to tie the planet formation time scale mm -hmm. to a dis dispersion time scale, mm -hmm. which in principle is unrelated. Mm -hmm. yes. And you, you pointed out what the problem is, yeah. that, it, that this alpha mm -hmm. almost has to be wrong because uh, you can't have the same alpha with radius okay. over very many orders of magnitude right. And with time, right. okay. Right. So, uh, so the, the uncomfortable thing is that uh, you can be placed in a situation where if you remove the disk too fast, mm -hmm. then you don't have any giant planets, right. gaseous giant planets. Right. And if you wait too long, mm -hmm. then what will end up happening is that you accrete everything, and you lose all your planets together with your gas as the gas accretes. Right. So there is this uncomfortable situation that you have, and you're trying to find the causal relationship between the two time scales. You right. pointed out some things. Right. But at this point, it's totally up in the air, and the alpha, uh, we don't understand it. Very far, you could have mechanisms, or the closer, we don't have any mechanisms. I would also like to stress at this point that you really don't know what the gas disk dispersal time is. And that's something that I'm working on separately, which we, where we look for a gas disk. We look at lines. So I have these thermochemical models that actually look for line emission. And, but I personally believe it's probably of the same order, but this is just a belief. I mean, we have right. no observational constraint that's really solid on the gas disk so, lifetime. So, right, so, so that that, that's my question there. Yeah. Uh, so for, uh, for those missions, you, yeah. so you mentioned H2 and that Spitzer goes out to 40 AU. Yeah. So how far are there any missions that will show H2? I'll not actually further? image the disk. For how far? To it will image distance? the disk. To no, to 20 AU or something like that. It will. I mean, and if they're really close by disks, and when it's fully functional, all the antennas are up. You know, there's a lot of disks already in the cycle zero. There's like tons of disk studies are planned for ALMA. And hopefully, we'll be able to answer these questions very soon. And, you know, so you don't really need, uh, I should point out that you don't really need to the, know the mass. I mean, you could sort of do a statistical study like it was done for the infrared, the Hill and Van plot that I showed you. All you need to know is, you know, you can just look at a bunch of stars and see age them and see, do they have a disk or don't they have a disk? And at what point does it disappear? And that should tell you uh, mean this dispersal time scale, even though you don't know how much there is. So I think that's good enough. And it's better than what we have at present anyway. Yeah. I have a question, Uma. Yeah. Very good talk, with a lot of information. Um, could you comment a little bit on Herschel Telescope and what kind of contribution you expect from Herschel yes, Telescope? So I've been working, so we've been looking for things with Herschel. So this is a follow-up of the Spitzer study that I showed you, the Pascucci plot that, that showed the 5 to 30 million year time scale where we looked for gas in the 5 to 40 AU region. So we have this survey that's going on of, of disks, uh, but now looking in the far infrared, so now you're probing a little further out. And I actually think that it's a better probe because things will last longer there. So we're looking for O1, the 63 micron line, from a bunch of different disks. So unfortunately, uh, the pack sensitivity is such that you need to stare at it for a long time. So we have a survey that's going on sort of half done, and we have one detection of a disk. And interestingly enough, it doesn't show CO, it shows O1 which is one of the first uh, such discoveries. And it didn't show any emission in the Spitzer band. So, yeah, but, yeah, in the future, maybe, yeah. Hi. Um, in the early stages of this process, we have a cold molecular cloud, mm -hmm. and it's being compressed subsonically. Mm -hmm. At some point, uh, it appears to speed up. We get supersonic effects, shock waves, and so on. Right. Can you tell me exactly what point in the process the shock waves begin to appear? Well, you know, it's like, it's sort of like this. You start, so initially when you start out with the cold core, right, it is, it is balanced, so this is gas, it's balanced by thermal pressure, which is really very, very low. These things are very cold at the order of 10 to 80 Kelvin. And this believed to be some turbulence, some amount of magnetic field. So all these things together sort of counteract gravity, right? But once uh, you have accumulated like in a given sphere, let's say, you've accumulated enough gas that, you know, you have, um, so gravity dominates over these other pressures, you can see that it's a runaway process because once you've shrunk it, then your gravity increases even more and then it, it keeps, it's a collapse process because it keeps going on. 
and the, um, the velocity of inflow can be calculated. And it's at some point that you sort of form you know, a shock around the forming object because things are falling too fast. But that's, I think, way you wanted to know the time, or I, I'm so sorry. I, Oh, no, it's way, way ahead of that. It's, so it's way in the embedded phase that you would actually see these things. But um, yeah, but there is no, I, I, it's very hard to see these embedded objects because they're so obscured by the envelope around them that nothing really radiates out all the way till they get. So the star, it turns out, so if you, if you remember from the second plot that I showed you, the DG tau, even there, the disk was obscuring the star. You sort of only see it when it illuminates the cavities, right? So there are observations, for example, with Herschel, which are trying to look for uh, far infrared emissions. So you look at these cold cores where you have no traces of any optical sources at all, and then try to see if you see any far infrared source, because then that would mean that there is something, there's a nascent protostar in there. And, yeah. Not, no, not at that stage, I don't think so, yeah. I've got a question here. Is a simple chemistry question okay? Mm -hmm. What is the nature of the dust and what do we know about its photochemistry? Um, well, it's, it's believed to be la largely silicates, some amount, some amount of graphite. There are probably others in the audience who know better than me, but it's n in the interstellar medium, it's mostly silicates and, uh, and there is about 30% of graphite or so. And that's what it initially starts out as. So there are some iron locked up in them, the magnesium silicates mostly, iron magnesium silicates. And um, um, you mean photochemistry as in uh, their, their refer? Oh, under the, uh, the, the irradiation? No, so the, yeah, so if, they're usually pretty big. I mean, there's the order of, um, microns or so, submicrons actually. So the really small particles do get transiently heated, for instance, by photons, optical photons. So there are things that are of the order of um, um, 100 angstroms, or the pars as they call them, right? So those do get affected. They sort of show emission features. They get excited. And they also show transient heating. And when they get really close to the star, they actually sublimate because at about 1500K, most of the dust particles sort of just sublimate. So there is like a dust truncation radius when you get really close to the star, which is typically about half AU or even less, much less, and it's probably 0.1 AU or so close to the star. You're getting hot enough that they evaporate, sort of. One more question. How, yeah. Where is the graphite? How, how does anyone observe graphite? From features. Like they actually have, um, it's amorphous carbon, really. It's amorphous, it's amorphous carbon. carbon, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, do we know if there's any gas or dust left in the Oort cloud around our solar system? I don't know. I don't think there's no gas for sure, but I don't know about. I mean, there could be gas from things, you know, that are that are sublimating or evaporating, outgassing of things. That right, but not there. from the original. Not from the original. Yes, no, okay. Okay, no, no. uh, I have um, a special mug for you here. Oh, uh, hopefully you can Why? use this as a dust you. collection experiment or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> you were, uh, Thank you so much. Please join me in thanking you for a great Thank you.